Okay, so we're carrying on um, with our um, international comparisons, and we were just reflecting on the on on the sort of the, the international rankings of countries and and some of the patterns there. And now we focus, and and we concluded with with something really interesting. Um, we said that Australia is uh, really low in those international homicide rankings. So this is a this is would be identified by global norms as a low violence society, and yet clearly in some ways violence is still a very very serious problem. I mean to say it's low on the international rankings is not to even begin to argue that it's not a problem. But we need to look deep more deeply into this question of, 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 of um, the, the levels of violence. Now, firstly, we need to put this in historical con context. And the opening introduction of that, that, that book that we're using at, at the moment, Australian Violence, um, which I strongly recommend, um, makes this claim, and, and I quote, modern Australia is the product of, mass, of a massive historical act of violence. And that, that's really interesting. So we're saying that this, what is a, a low violence society is actually a historical product of very, very high levels of violence. Um, and they two, they two kind of main sort of streams of this kind of violence. The first is the violence of colonization. And, and, and Australia is by no means the only country characterized by a, um, a, a history of, of, of co colonial violence. And, and we need to understand that colonization, although it used to be often represented as this kind of benign um, uh, process, the way in which the sort of, as the West grew sort of wiser and, 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 more, um, and more advanced, it spread out over the world, bringing, um, you know, science, civilization, modern medicine, economic development um, to, to, to other countries that, that needed it. That story is a grotesque misrepresentation. Um, in fact, um, colonization tended to work by brute force um, the that that whole that the whole era, the sort of three hundred years of Western colonization, to a large extent depended on one very simple fact: that the West developed many technologies, but one in particular, which was derived from from science from that that already existed um, much longer ago in places like China and um, things like. Um, the use of, of gunpowder, but what West did is they, they used the, they used gunpowder for weapons, and they and they made guns, and um, the, the 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 use of firearms gave the Western societies a fundamental military advantage for a certain period in history, and it was this military advantage that. Um, that enabled a lot of, of, of colonization to happen. And it, so colonization did literally happen through the barrel of a gun in most contexts. And it happened um, against people who, who, who couldn't defend themselves against that, that kind of military technology at the time. So yes, um, colonization works precisely by seizing people's land, seizing the materials that are available um, by brute force, primarily. Um, uh, obviously, it plays out differently in different places, but this is the, but but this is an underlying theme um, that if one if one looks into the history, um, the history of the, the last several hundred years of Western colonialism is is first of all a history of violence, and this violence is perhaps shown nowhere more more starkly than in the practice of slavery that linked to colonialism was this massive um, sort of global system of slavery, not only the transatlantic slave trade, um, which the United States is so um, well known for, but, but around the rest of the world, uh, peoples were enslaved, including despite recent denials by the Australian prime minister, um, um, uh, slavery took place here, yeah. um, and 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 was an important part of the of of the colonial practice. Okay, but not only not only was there the 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 murder and dispossession um, 
uh, of uh, Aboriginal Australians. Um, but there was another element to colonial violence, and that was the fact that 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 that, um, that the country was essentially a prison um, colony. Um, that that parts of Australia were the places where prisoners were sent, and so the violence of exile, incarceration, and forced labour um, of, of of the colonial uh, settlers was also a huge part of of, of history. Um, so this is kind of double that that there's the, the colonial violence against um, indigenous people, but also the colonial violence of of um, the country as a as a as a as a penal colony as a place of 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 brutal um imprisonment forced labor incarceration okay um and there are two very good um films that i encourage you to look at and compare and contrast because they give two different accounts of that history um and they're both readily available they're both um local films the one is called The Proposition, um, and the other is a recent award-winning movie called Sweet Country, and I will give you links to both of those. Um, okay, but, but there we have this history of violence um, leading up to what is considered, by global standards, of a fairly low violent society. But it's more complicated than that. Yes, we can see, for instance, that in the last few decades, since, especially since the 1970s, um, very significant declines in, in homicide nationally. Um, but when we look closely at that decline, we also see that it's very, very uneven. It's not just that homicide is demean declining, it's that it's also shifting, that some some groups of people are more vulnerable to violence than others. What's interesting at the same time is that some groups of people feel very vulnerable to violence. Like if you, if you go online, you look at the comments made on, on, on kind of media reports of, of crimes and things, there's certain groups of people that are, that are commenting a lot and they're commenting in a very stressed out, anxious and angry way. But what's interesting is when you look into who's commenting in the most agitated way about the risks of violence, strangely enough, it's very often the people who are least at risk themselves. Um, so, so, although, uh, uh, the, the, so there's this unevenness, some people are more at risk than others, but the extent to which people feel at risk and the extent to which they publicly express their anxieties about being at risk don't match what's actually going on. In fact, in a strange way, they, they're sometimes almost the opposite. So that's a thing that we're going to have to think about much more deeply, is why is there this um, unevenness in the patterns of violence of who's vulnerable and who's not? And why is there this total lack of correlation, or perhaps even a negative correlation, um, between who feels worried about being a victim and who really is a victim in certain cases. Um, okay, um, so the, this work, Australian Violence, uh, is, a, is, is a sort of updating of um, a, 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 a really interesting major study that was conducted back in 1988. And it's an interesting study because it was really quite sort of world leading in the way in which it really critically thought about violence. It didn't just take like, oh, here's the stats, here's you know, the, the official criminal justice account of what's going on. It, it got much deeper than that. And, to the, and, and, and it's such a sort of a, a good and um, revealing analysis that it, it remains an important um, starting point for us today. The first thing they did, which we've already talked about, um, um, is they they took a broad rather than a narrow definition of violence. Now we've already said that that violence is always the definition is always kind of socially constructed. It always comes out of certain perspectives, comes out of certain societies, and they deliberately didn't take either the kind of the the the, the, the most kind of popular. And, um, sort of idea of violence. Violence is murder, uh, violent street crime, uh, sexual assault. 
Um, and they and they said no it's a lot of other things as well and they and they introduced these terms which are going to think about much more deeply in the course they talk about um, expressive versus instrumental violence which we which we mentioned before um, they also talked about collective structural and institutional violence which are really interesting things because those lead us away from the idea of a kind of a street criminal you know pulling a weapon on someone those are those are quite different conceptualizations. So the expressive versus instrumental, remember we discussed last week, um, the kind of emotional outburst, the jealous, angry violence versus the, the cold calculating, like deliberately doing violence to achieve a material goal. Um, they, 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 they explore those two, but they explore these like institutional, collective and structural notions of violence. So we're gonna have to talk about what those mean. Um, and so, for instance, they, they go beyond the normal criminal justice definitions of, 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 of violent crimes. And, and we're going to talk about that a little too. So what is the relation between, between violence and, and, and crime? Are all forms of violence criminalized? Um, and, 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 and that becomes a little more complicated, but, but that's not in this video. That's still to come. So they identify, you know, the obvious things like of terrorism. Yes, yeah, sure, we can all see that as a kind of violence. But but also looking at at at, at the way kind of violence is, is 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 normal and regulated within sport. So um, you know, with with within uh, football and things like that, there there's certain kinds of violence that is not only allowed but is kind of pleasing to the audiences and actually you know makes people excited. But this, but then that's carefully regulated in the other kinds of violence, which 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 are are, are then offences and and um, which will you know result in in kind of formal punishments within the sport. So it's really interesting looking at at, at that as an example because there you see a really interesting thing. It is much more common than than you might believe, is the way in which not all violence is taken as bad. Some of it is thought of as good. And then we have to do this weird kind of um, drawing a line of saying, well, that amount of violence is good, but whoa, 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 that's bad. Like this kind of tackle, that's, that's, that, that, that's a real demonstration of kind of agility and bravery, but that kind of tackle is, is, is totally unacceptable. That, that could have led to injury. Um, and, and how exactly that balancing act between like, oh, we, we kind of like this, this bit of violence here, but whoa, 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 that's overstepping the mark. Um, and, 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 and in contact sports, we really see that as an issue. Um, so, th so think about that. Think about how in, in things like contact sports, the line between acceptable and unacceptable violence or use of force plays out. Then they also said, look, there's not only, you know, the violence of criminals, um, uh, and, uh, and violence, violence that is not criminalized. There's also the violence by the state and by the enforcers of the law. And of course, this really jumps out as a, at us. 2020 was, was, was in many ways the year of Black Lives Matter coming out of the United States, but also becoming a massive uh, social issue here. The idea that, that in fact, in a country like the US, the police are not only the, um, functioning to prevent um, violence. They're not only functioning to ensure the safety of the public, they're also major perpetrators of violence, especially against vulnerable groups. So the way in which but the police, the criminal justice system can be perpetrators of violence, and certainly there's a long history um, of, of, of minorities suffering a kind of brutal end of criminal justice. Um, of um, indigenous people being massively disproportionately targeted by the criminal justice systems, um, ending up being um, being harassed, being um, imprisoned, and 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 dying in custody at far higher rates than are proportional um, to the overall population. Um, so they so the, so that so they looked at that. They didn't just look at you know, the sort of traditional notion of uh, 
uh, violent, violent criminals on the street, but also the violence of, of the society and the criminal justice system. But, but they took it even further than that. And, and we'll, we'll revisit this in more depth right at the end of the course. They actually looked at kind of social disadvantage and inequality in relation to justice. Um, and not only the way in which people are already socially disadvantaged, people from, from kind of racial minorities, gender minorities, often experience more violence than, than, than people from the, 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 the sort of dominant groups in the society. Um, but also the way in which social disadvantage can even be thought of, that the, the mere fact of social disadvantage could be perhaps in some sense thought of as being violent. But we're going to talk about that much later in the course. Um, and this led them to, 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 do it, to move away from the kind of everyday notion of violence. And this is what's so important, is that they, they start by saying, well, let's not just focus on the kind of the media, the media noise, the, the media focus on these, these big acts, these terrible homicides, these, these, these brutal um, rapes, um, and say, wait a minute, there's, there's violence happening across different aspects of everyday life. Um, and some of it doesn't get into the media, and some of it doesn't even get into the criminal justice system. Um, and we need to look at that. Um, so, so both the kind of smaller kinds of violence and the bigger kinds of violence, the, the violence that is not just a person attacking another, but, 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 uh, that, but, but is the kind of violence that this, the society does to people in the way it's organized. Um, once again, they noted exactly what we had talked about before, is this, 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 this misfit, this mismatch between what people worry about and what they you know, write to uh, you know, comments about on social media and what they tell their politicians they want versus what is actually going wrong. That, that what people are stressing out about and what they are actually at risk of aren't matching. Um, and we need to understand that. We need to investigate that much more deeply and say what's going on there. Why, why, why what people scared of and what, what, can, what is actually likely to happen to them? Why are these things kind of pulling in opposite directions? Um, and they drew attention to the way in which the meanings of violence change. So writing in 1988, there'd already been changes, there'd been a, a sensitization to certain kinds of gender violence, which, which has, has, has fortunately um, been developed even further now, more recently. But also they started asking questions about, about violence against children, for instance, um, and, and acceptable acts of force against children like corporal punishment. And they started raising questions about that. Um, and of course, this also was um, uh, at a time when the, the question of, of guns and violence came to the fore. Um, okay, so a couple of things that they, they concluded, but the big one, and I'm, and I'm quoting now, Violence is not randomly distributed, but is patterned by age, race, and geography. It is relational and associated with socioeconomic disadvantage and other forms of inequality. Okay, so firstly, violence isn't the same in different aspects of society. It's, 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 it's unevenly distributed. Um, firstly, by age, um, young adults... Um, Young uh, children and young adults tend to actually be victims of violence much more than middle-aged people. Um, ethnic and racial minorities tend to be sub victims of violence more. Um, there's different violence in sort of rural and regional areas to in the cities. Um, but one of the strong things that it's connected to is socioeconomic disadvantage and other forms of in inequality, such as um, you know, citizenship versus uh, um, migrant status, um, that each of those, like each, each, each form of kind of social disadvantage seems to make people more vulnerable to violence um, um, than if they had been in a, um, um, a more privileged position in society. Okay, 
And they drew a number of, of strong conclusions because the aim of this analysis was to, to really make a set of proposals. And unfortunately, the, you know, these proposals were reflected on, but, but, but many of them weren't really followed through. Like somehow the, the, the real concern to solve the problem of violence, you know, it's so subject to sort of political um, blowings of the wind, you know, that, 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 that it's seen as a problem one day and not another. Different, different sides of the political spectrum typically to approach the problem very differently. The sort of right-wing way of thinking how to solve the problem of violence tends to everywhere be quite different to the left-wing way of, of thinking about solving it. And that in itself is so interesting, is to look at how do, how do different political standpoints think about the problem of violence quite differently. Anyway, but here's a couple of things that they, the, of their strong conclusions, and these are, are really important conclusions for the course. And, and they become a kind of a launch pad for us to think about the, the coming weeks. Firstly, we can't base our understanding of violence on the kind of popular ideas of, of, of like what, what regular folk think about violence, because mostly what they think is, is actually wrong. Um, uh, it needs to be based on actual research. It needs to be based on, an, on, on evidence, investigations of what's really happening, what, what, not what people are worrying about, okay? Secondly, we've massively overinvested, and this was Gilligan's argument um, in how to think about violence, in, 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 a, in an approach to violence that is about punishment. And we haven't really even begun to get deep enough into prevention as a, as, as a way of dealing with this problem, that the criminal justice approach is primarily a, a, a system of control and punishment. And, and, and to a very small extent, a system of prevention. And, and it isn't necessarily appropriate structure if we're gonna think about prevention. So the need to really focus on, 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 on what prevention would mean effectively. Um, the third thing is the need to support um, vulnerable people. And this includes supporting children and families that are at risk for various reasons. And so to go in and look at the kind of social conditions that are precursors to violence and, and the context in which people become at risk of being either perpetrators or victims. So they're um, really strengthening support to, fa to, to, to families and children. Um, but further than that, to address two big, uh, several types of, of social equality, the first being gender inequality because of the strongly gendered nature of violence, that gender inequality needs to be addressed. The other thing is economic inequality needs to, to, to be addressed because economic vulnerability and vulnerability to violence seem to be very strongly correlated. Um, so this is now moving away very far from a purely criminal justice approach. I mean, this is a real kind of social, social transformational approach. Um, rather than just a punitive, controlling criminal justice approach. Um, and of course, questions of nationality, questions of race, questions of ethnicity, and addressing those inequalities. Um, and the other thing they pointed to is there needed to be a serious look at the underlying cultures of violence, the way in which the society accepts certain forms of violence. And not just the not just the way in which we react to the ones that are criminalized, but the ones that the ones that aren't criminalized, the perhaps the the the, the bullying, the ways of treating children, the ways of behaving in intimate relationships, um, those things. There's a lot of forms of violence that are actually kind of seen as socially acceptable. Men um, sort of getting drunk and getting into physical, uh, you know, fist fights with each other. These kinds of things that are that, that, that actually they, they kind of dismissed as being, yeah, that's what people do. Um, and and we, need to look, we need to look at those, the, the, the cultures of violence, not just at the individual criminal acts. Um, so the, the idea there is to, um, to move away from these, the, the, this like going after people who've broken the law and rather look at the, the society, the culture, the system in which um, not only acts of violence, but patterns of violence occur.
um, and to think about that in a preventative rather than just a punitive way. Okay, having said that, um, I want to leave you with a kind of set of open-ended questions, serious questions that I want you to, 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 to really work on in, in, in your own head. Um, the first, uh, and, and so in the, the, these are listed in the last slide. The first is, um, the thing to do is, try and make a list of things that could be considered violent crimes in the future, even though they aren't at the moment. Like what kind of thing do we accept and think, it, well, it might not be great, but it's not a crime and the cops are not going to come if you do it. But in the future, that might change and that thing may actually become a thing which you may end up being prosecuted for. Can you imagine anything that would fit into that kind of category? And what would it be? Um, second question. Okay, we respond to violence in various ways. We call the cops, we do whatever we do. Can you, can you identify what responses to violence that we use already that are themselves violent in one way or another? And they might be violent in obvious ways and they might be violent in, in kind of very subtle and perhaps controversial ways which may not be sure are violent. But think about that. What kind of things, what, when do we react to, to violence with with other things that could also be thought of as violent responses. Um, you know, and there's, there's, there's some obvious examples, like, oh, if someone tries to, to punch you and you punch them, you know, that's responding to, but there, there, there's also much more interesting, much more subtle examples that, that, that I want you to try and imagine. Having done that, then try and think of, um, possible responses to violence that aren't violent. Like, what does it mean to, to go into a situation where there is violence or threat of violence and respond in a non-violent way? Can you think of existing examples of that? And can you imagine perhaps examples that don't yet exist but could? So think about that. Um, and the final one, um, the, the little fourth uh, little thought experiment is, can you imagine... Uh, responses to violence that aren't punitive but are preventative. What does it mean to th think of a particular type of violence and think about how to prevent it rather than to punish it? And what do you come up with there? Having suggested those four little thought experiments, I, I, I then want to leave you with a, a, a big question which I'm going to talk about a little bit in the, in the next video. And that is, Something I really notice looking at social media and looking at the kind of political debates and things people get upset about is a lot of people really worry about certain kinds of violence, but the responses that they typically propose are, are punitive. They are angry about things that are happening and what they want is they want the cops to come in. They want the cops to be you know, more severe in their interventions. They want the issuing of longer sentences. They want pr prison conditions to be harsher. They overall, there's this really kind of popular thing, and it's an, and and it's it seems to be a, in many societies that people really want punitive responses to violence. That's that's the thing emotionally. That's the feeling they've got. They really want to punish people for 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 victimizing them. And why is that? Why, when, pe when most people think about responding to violence, do they think punitively? And, and, and see what you can come up with in answering that question. So that's given you a lot to, to think about. So spend some time with those questions, because thinking about those questions will really kind of open a space for you to understand the kind of discussions we're going to have in the next few weeks.